most of the theorists or Kant's scholarship do not get around to read the groundworks, as I call it, a short um, name for a very long text that is actually half of this text. Some of it here is a commentary. And so I'm going to describe the essence of the groundwork, which in fact is fundamental to understand Kant's moral political axis. And when we talk about morals, remember that for Kant, it is more of a, a political statement than it is what we consider morals now. The categorical imperative is what I call a pure concept. And so what, what does it mean to have um, um, a pure concept that is, that in fact is a reality? And this is, this is truly the beauty of a, a Kantian groundwork is that for him a theory must be functioning in practice. But for a theory to function in practice, it has to be universal. In other words, it has to fit all of us. And it has to be unconditional. In other words, it has to be absolute, which is a tough thing for us in our modern society to digest because we hate absolute uh, formulas or principles. We feel that those impose upon us. And the 18th century was pretty much like us. And, and of course, what does it mean then to have peace that is unconditional? What does it mean to have a formula that in fact tells us that peace must happen? What kind of a formula has that kind of a, a commanding power over us? That is my research that I have been conducting for the past five years. I started with um, very simple peace theories. There are so many of them. And then bumped into the democratic peace theory. But as we know, although democracies have spread in the world, democracies for some reason are not uh, in fact, bringing peace to all of us. And so let's take a look at some uh, terms because we need, to, we need to know what Kant is talking about. And the beauty, in fact, of a, a, pure, a pure formula or a pure concept of reason, and realize that for Kant, the critique of reason, of course, as you all know, is that we needed to understand the limitation of knowledge. And uh, Mendelssohn has called Kant the all-crushing Kant because at that time they were dealing with a lot of dogmas. So to start asking questions and to, to critique what we think is a given, a fact, like Latour a uh, uh, black scientific box, for example, where facts are there and we don't dare open them up because they're facts. And what Kant is doing in the critique of pure reason is that he's creating a method of analysis that in fact asks a lot of question about the realities that we create in our life. And so, for example, the analytical concept or method tells us what is around us, what is a concept. So it points to God, for example. It's a great example because we are fighting over religious matters so much throughout generation, but it doesn't really justify the assumption that God in fact exists, right? You know, we don't know if God exists, but it still is a concept. But to get the reality of God. We need to create something, in fact, different. We need to bring in a third element that explains that concept, which we have not been able really to do, have we? And so peace for Kant is a categorical imperative. It's unconditional. It's a pure concept 
that has universal appeal. Duty is a word that is not exactly um, um, a popular word. We don't really like the word duty. But for Kant, the categorical imperative is a pure formula that, in fact, must be enacted from duty. And from duty means that we enact it not because we're obligated to do it, although we are obligated to do it. It's a, it's a formula that has an ought or a must in it, but because we understand it. And when we understand it, it means that it belongs to us. This is one of the most beautiful part about the categorical imperative that hardly anyone truly understand. Number one, it's a unique formula that, in fact, resides inside of us. It's our autonomy. It's what makes humanity so unique and so beautiful for Kant. Many theorists think of Kant as an abstract thinker, and he is. Um, it took me the first reading of the grand work about three months, and we're talking about simply maybe 60 pages. It is a condensed, compact, and complex book. An old, old scholar compared it to the gnashing of the teeth, because it really, you read a sentence and you think, what does it mean? And what it means is that you actually need to go into Kant's whole work. And so the trick to, to reading Kant and understanding Kantian peace is to actually involve yourself in many of his works, his lectures, his letters, notes and fragments that he wrote uh, next to his books tell you how he was thinking and how Kant think is the key to unveiling his formulas, especially the categorical imperative, because we think of the categorical imperative as too abstract. In other words, why would we have a formula that in fact guides us and is comprised of laws that we must obey, because we are living in, in an era where everything is so individualized. But we need to understand that the laws that emanate from the categorical imperatives, or as Kant calls them, the doctrines of right and virtues, are laws, in fact, that begin inside a human being's will. And so, Kant equates our will with what he calls practical reason. That's the power of pure reason to construct, in fact, formulas, laws of freedoms that belong to all of humanity. Now, what does it mean to have pure reason and what's the ultimate intention? And here is where there is a nice little twist that Kant um, brought to light. And that twist is found within the groundwork. In other words, I implore upon you, for those of you who love Kant as much as I do, to read the groundwork, even though it is difficult, even though it is frustrating. To realize freedom means that we realize, in fact, our own humanity is that we realize, in fact, that duty is the dignity of every human being. And that is, in fact, Kantian peace. The reason that it is universal, the reason that it is an absolute condemnation of war, is that war, in fact, destroys the dignity of humanity, the worthiness of every individual. And so, one of the things that we need to explore a little bit later on is why is the, the democratic 
peace theory does not really work in our time. What's, what's missing in that theory? And indeed, it is the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals. The lesson in the groundworks, what this formula, or in fact formulas, because within the formula of the categorical imperative, there are five distinct formulas that comprise the ultimate normative theory or practical reason. Just so we are on the same page, I just want to know that normative theory in international relations is how we ought to govern ourselves. What will be the best structure that we can build together as a society? And for Kant, it is the Republican or the democratic society, which in fact is very different than our democratic not in the, the building of what democratic is, not in the structure itself, but in the way in which we enact our democratic laws. Here is the categorical imperative. I want you to read it carefully, very carefully. What does it mean at the same time? At the same time means equality. We enact this formula at the same time as other people. A maxim, by the way, is a subjective principle. The objective principle, such as a categorical imperative, is a principle that, according to Kant, we create a logical argue that justify the validity of that formula, which is what the groundwork is all about. Just that like the critique of pure reasons argues for the formula of pure reason, for what pure reason is actually all about, so does the groundwork argues away from empirical research, it's a logical argument that uses only concepts of the mind, and what's beautiful about it, of course, is that Kant has taught us in the first critique that our mind is an amazing creative tool. Reason creates other reasons. In other words, our mind thinks on its own and creates its own structures. That's where we actually realize that what we call rational and look upon it as too rational, it's too abstract, it's too rational, it's devoid of emotions, for Kant, in fact, represents the whole of a human being, the wholeness of who we are as individuals. And so practical reason, which is the categorical imperative, means that we have a guiding normative compass that allows us to ask the question, are, is the action, are our actions as a collective or is my action as an individual good for all of us? Because what I do affects you and what you do affects me. Now, this is the negative part of the categorical imperative, which means is what should I not do? What actions do I have that, in fact, ah, and I have three more minutes. OK, we will hurry this along so you get to see the beauty of the whole formula. What do I do that affects you is what you do that affects me, correct? That's the beauty of the law of nature. Just like laws of nature are made of cause and effect, so do laws of freedom, and that means that our actions change the world around us. The end in itself is the formula of humanity means that every one of us is worthy beyond any price. Do you see the deep emotion that is connected to this very abstract formula? That is the power of the categorical imperative. It brings together the power of humanity, the dignity of humanity, to enact laws that are absolutely good for everyone. That's what peace is all about. Because remember, peace 
is reason, reason that sits on the throne and that politics, in fact, bows its knees in front. The formula is autonomy is, is the formula that allows us as human beings to think about the laws that we legislate and the laws that we enact. And this is what it comes down to, which is the right of humanity, the sacredness of humanity, the immense dignity that politics must bend its knee before. And when Kant says before right, he doesn't just talk about right as a law, he talks about right as who you are as a human being. You are the source of that right. You are the source of the doctrines or, or the laws of freedom that create rights and create virtues, which are duties. Now, one last thing is that Kant was uh, a theorist of human development, even though we did not have at that uh, time human development. They had anthropology, which we translate into psychology for our time. But his philosophy of history, and if you have a chance to read any of his uh, essays, really speak about the development of consciousness, of our awareness as human being, our awareness of ourselves, our awareness of others. And the reason being is that we needed to get to the point where we're able to build the kingdom of ends, which is his ultimate purpose, and that is the egalitarian society. That's the democratic society that enacts peace, that is built upon our, our right to have freedom as an individual and to allow others to have freedom as other individuals around us and as a collective. I have a couple other slides, but I think that you got the essence of the beauty of the categorical imperative. Thank you all so much.